Amen, amen, amen. God is good all the time, and all the time the Lord is good. Amen. Can we just do something that might just be out of the ordinary, might not be customary, right, right where you are? Can you just get stand up where you are and just give God the glory, just purpose to honor him, sanctify that place right now? You may be in your bedroom. You may be in your living room. You may be in your car. You may be uh, at the kitchen table, but just sanctify that place right now. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we love you and we magnify your holy name. There's nobody like you in all the earth. Hallelujah. I promise you if, you, if you make him bigger than your problem, your problem will change its perspective. Hallelujah. If you make him bigger than your situation, hallelujah, that situation will change in perspective. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Magnifying God changes how you see the issue. Magnifying God changes how you see the circumstance magnifying God hallelujah lifts you above everything trying to pull you down hallelujah the Bible says lift up your heads O ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is this king of glory the Lord Almighty the Lord mighty in battle hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. Listen, I said it before, and this is this, it's, it's new revelation to me, and it might be old to you, but please indulge me. That scripture says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. He's not talking about metal. He's not talking about wood. He's not talking about the, a, a, a physical gate. He's talking about you and me. We, we dictate what comes in and what goes. We dictate what, 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 stay, what comes inside and what stays outside. And when we fail to put God in his rightful place, we open up the gates and open up the doors to ungodly things like worry and fear and frustration and anger and unforgiveness. But the Bible says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. You who have the, you have, it, it, you have to say so what comes and what stays. And what gives us, what gives us the, 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 the wisdom to know what should come in and what should stay out is where God is, where we place God. Is God a fixture in your life or is he a, a, an accessory? He says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. <laughs> Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Lift up your heads. Look beyond the problem. Look above the situation. Look into the one who the Bible says, look into the hills from which cometh your help. Because you understand that all your help comes from the Lord. What the scripture was admonishing us, look to your source of supply. Look to where you know your strength comes from. Acknowledge him. Recognize him to be the God of all creation. And the king of glory shall come in. Hallelujah. Father, we lift you up above every circumstance, above every problem. In spite of what it looks like, you're still God over COVID. You're still bigger than COVID-19. You're still bigger than bigotry, racism, hatred. You're bigger than all of it, God. Instead of letting those things in, we choose to let you in. Instead of letting those things in to contaminate and defile our spirits and our heart, we choose to let you in today, God. Father, we love you today and we give you glory in Jesus' name for your presence being manifest right where we are. In the name that's a, that is above all names, the name Jesus Christ. Every believer shouted amen, amen. Right where you are, come on, magnify him, magnify him. Bless his name, hallelujah. 
Oh, come magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Come magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Come on. I dare you to make him bigger. I dare you to make him bigger. I dare you to make him bigger. Glory, 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 glory. Make him bigger. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Forgive us for running to worship, running to worry instead of running to worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're the God of all creation. You're the Alpha and the Omega. You're the beginning and the end. There's nobody like you, oh God. And we reverence your name right where we are. We turn our kitchens into sanctuaries. We turn our bedrooms into sanctuaries right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. Come on, fire up your oven. Hallelujah. Fire up your oven. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Come on, fire up your oven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory, glory. Ah, glory. Ah, God. Oh, Jesus. And I can just... I, I hear I hear someone saying, well, Pastor, I want to, but I I hadn't done it in, in such a long time. I hadn't entered this far in a long time because of guilt or shame or anger, whatever the case may be. And I don't know. How will I know when my oven is hot? How do I know? And I was just reminded of something. During this time of prayer and fasting, a roasted peanut was my best friend. And I would heat my oven and every other day I'd go through a bag of peanuts. And when I turned my oven on, if I wasn't thinking, I'd wonder, smell peanuts it was the smell from the last thing I had in my oven so if you feel like you don't know pastor I don't know I don't know how to turn it on I don't know how do I know if I've turned it on the last thing you you put in the oven the last thing you fired up for God will be what permeates the atmosphere will the last time you gave him worship, the last time you gave him praise, 
It'll remind you. The oven's on. The oven's hot. It'll remind the last time you worshiped him in spirit and in truth. The last time you gave him the glory. The last time. The last time you lifted your hands in worship. He'll remind you. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory. Glory to God. Fire him up. Fire up your oven. Father God, we thank you. We bless you today. We love you. Forgive us, God, right now for letting things and people get in the way between our worship. But when we know better, we do better. So we thank you now, God. Thank you for open arms, welcoming, welcoming us back like the prodigal son. Thank you for opening your arms and loving us the same way you loved us before we left. God, we thank you. I thank you for my broken brothers and sisters coming back. Thank you for my wounded brothers and sisters coming back. In the name of Jesus, finding the same love that they left waiting on them. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are who've been looking for this love but been looking in the wrong places. I thank you that they're being introduced to the everlasting agape love of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We love you and we magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah. Cunning Lee Johnson said, I wouldn't serve a God I couldn't feel sometimes. I wouldn't serve a God I couldn't feel sometimes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. while there are physical structures the real house is you the real house is you but we are the temple of the Holy Ghost ah, Christ dwells in us God we thank you for your presence You're bigger than anything we could face. Physically, financially, relationally, you're bigger. Help us to keep this perspective. Ah, it is so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you, wherever you are, can just one more time, can we just give him one more shout? Ah, God. He loves it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. Ah, God, we love you. We love you. We love you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We give God the glory. We give him the praise. Hallelujah. For the Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. Ah, God. My Bible says if you seek me, God says with your whole heart, you'll find me. 
And there's no way you can have an encounter with God and not leave the same, leave the same way. There's no way. An encounter with God is transforming. It is transitioning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's an exchange that comes. And when I first was made aware of that, I said, God, I don't have anything to bring. He says, yeah, you do. He said, you got, you got ashes. Give me the ashes and I'll give you my beauty. Give me your spirit of heaviness and I'll give you the spirit of joy. I never said it was equitable. Never said it. <laughs> If we measured it according to, 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 to society's structure, God would be getting the raw deal. But he takes broken things. And he takes broken people. And he takes messed up, screwed up lives and he makes them over again another. So don't ever think you don't have anything to give to God. Take your broken heart. I'm talking about the kind of broken where you had to vacuum it up because you couldn't pick up all the pieces by hand. Put them in a bag. And if you've got to carry it in a bag, God says, I can still do something with it. Hallelujah. We are grateful to be in the house of prayer this morning. Hallelujah grateful to be in his presence. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Let God renew. Let him restore. Let him refresh let him revive. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For 20, 20 days now, we've been purposeful, been deliberate to put ourselves in a position where we could not only hear from God. But we could receive direction, clarity, confirmation. We've been putting ourselves in position deliberately so that we could get reacquainted and be resensitized to the moving of God's Spirit. And God wouldn't be a good father if he didn't reveal to us some things we thought were right that weren't right. He wouldn't be a good father if he didn't have to chasten us in some areas. This time of prayer and fasting, not only has it brought breakthrough, it's it's brought correction. It's brought a soberness. Because if we be honest, some of us were drunk off of the moment. We were drunk off of this and that. and It brought about a soberness. It, it shook us. For some, this time of prayer and fasting brought about a fire, a fire. A refiner's fire. And you can't have fire without heat. And for some it got hot. But that's the only way that God can separate the stuff that doesn't belong. So that what remains is all him. Some of you are still trying, are still fighting the fire. 
I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I, I'm here to don't fight the fire because it's the fire. It's the fire that, that transforms you into who God has originally ordained you to be. You can't become the new vessel without going through the fire. Don't fight the fire. As long as you know who's in charge of the fire, our Lord and Savior God, he's going to make you over again another. Hallelujah. And so, so for those who are, who, are, who are anxious, do we know I got a couple of texts? Is it over now? Is it over? We'll declare 2 o'clock to be the official end day, end time, for our time of prayer and fasting. I encourage you on a practical tip. Don't go eating a steak. If you've been, if you've been doing the Daniel fast, I don't advise you to go and eat a big, meat-heavy meal because you'll be calling on God in another way. Your system has not, if you've been obeying this fast and doing like, 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 like instructed, your, your system has changed. And you're going to have to ease your way back into it. My prayer again is that you created some holy, holy habits. My prayer is that if you've been spending time, more time with God, why does it have to change? If you've been spending more time in your work, why does that have to change? I challenge you to keep the main thing the main thing. Seek the Lord. First, give him the first fruits of your day. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I want to just, once again, I can't say it enough. The crew here at the room who helped put this together, IT, uh, admin, Listen, ministers and deacons, these are some of the best people this side of heaven. I'm telling you, they are awesome, awesome, awesome. I thank God for each and every one of them. I thank God for uh, uh, our ministerial staff uh, who, who helped put together these last 21 days, uh, uh, the consecration corner, amen. I just thank God for each and every one of them, amen. Uh, diligent sharing, what God was sharing with them, it's been awesome, amen. And so now we're moving, we're moving as we move, continue to move, where we want to talk about what God laid on my heart for us. I'm, I'm not a <clears throat> necessarily a thematic preacher. I don't, I don't um, su subscribe necessarily to, to that, you know. Um, I, plus, I don't hear a whole lot of people uh, doing that now because there was a whole lot of people in, 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 uh, in, in 2020. God going to give you 2020 vision in 2020. But none of us saw COVID. Not one of them folks. He going to open your eyes. Okay. None of, none of us saw this coming. So I, I don't necessarily subscribe to it. I'm, and I don't knock anybody who does. But I, I do ask God for clarity. I ask God for focus. God, where, where do you want us to focus as we move into a new year? And he just said one word. He said hungry. 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 And he... The scripture that, that he gave as a foundation for me, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. There are a whole lot of people who are satisfying the hunger, but as we notice in the flesh, if we eat too much junk food, it starts messing with us. It may satiate the appetite, but it doesn't satisfy it. And God says, I need my people hungry for my word again. I need my people hungry for the things that advance the kingdom. So we're going to focus our attention on just the word hungry. What are you hungry for as a believer, as a child of God? If we're not careful, we'll take and adopt some of the world's appetites. And that's, I'm, I'm afraid that's what has happened in many of our churches. And, and, and our church is not exempt from it either. We can get caught up with the world's criteria and the, and the things that God wants us to be hungry for fall to the wayside. 
But I believe God's bringing us back to a place where we're hungry for him and hungry for the things that, that honor him. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that and lay that foundation. And I want to start today. <laughs> it's, 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 only a, it's only appropriate that we're, we're coming off of this time of prayer and fasting. Uh, uh, if you've been, seek, been honoring the Daniel fast, your palate has been cleansed to a certain degree. You, if you've not done your best, and sometimes it's hard because it's everywhere, done your best to stay away from sugars and, and, and breads and, no, and meats, your, your palate has changed. And spiritually, God says, I need, to, I, need to, I need to re-energize and reinvigorate your spiritual palate so that you're hungry for the things, so, you have, so that your taste, your taste is only for the things that God would have you, have you taste. Scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So we're going to talk about hunger for the next few weeks. Talk about hunger. We're going to do our Bible affirmation, and then we're going to get started. We're coming from Ruth, Ruth chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 7, where we're going to do our affirmation. Ready? Let's go. This is my Bible. It is the infallible, incorruptible, unstoppable, immutable word of God. It holds my peace, my victory, my breakthrough. This is my spiritual roadmap. This is my Bible. Amen. <clears throat> we're coming from Ruth uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, and we're going to get to that text. But I want to just start. Today, I wanna, I, I'm going to give you the title, and I need you to hang with me because we're going somewhere. The title for this message this morning is, It's Not Mike's Fault. It ain't. Well, it ain't Mike's fault. It ain't Mike's fault. Stay with me, please. It ain't Mike's fault. The Waffle House holds a significant place in me and my wife's heart. We love the Waffle House. When we were courting, some of our most memorable dates took place at the Waffle House in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. You remember that, baby? It's a college town. It's all you could eat for four, four fifty, And when you eat and sit, and eat some more. We love that. We love that place. After we got married, took the pictures and mingled at the reception, and packed up as many of our wedding gifts as we could fit into the car, the first place we stopped was at the Waffle House. On our wedding night, we went to the Waffle House. The Waffle House is special to us. Not to mention having some of the best waffles this side of heaven. Listen, God is in the Waffle House. I'm telling you, he's in the recipe. The Lord is in the recipe. Our children have even come to love and crave the wonder of the Waffle House. We are a Waffle House family. We take spirit. It's, it's a special trip to go to the Waffle House. It takes us 30 minutes to go to the Waffle House, our nearest Waffle House here, but we don't mind taking the trip because we love the Waffle House. And over the years, we've come to expect the same layout design. You can tell a Waffle House wherever you go. We've, we've come to expect the same yellow and brown color scheme, decent service, colorful personalities, taking our orders and, and the most delicious waffles ever created. I can't talk enough about how good the waffles are. Hungry. <laughs> but what do you do when Mike ain't make no batter? I got to tell y'all, so we, we went... We, we went to the Waffle House. And we all went. Karen went with us. It was a, I mean, it's a special moment. We look forward to going. And we get there, and, and it's semi-full. You know, it, 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 could, it could vary from day to day. And we get there, we get in a booth, and we're talking, and we're, 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 we're laughing, and we're, we're having fellowship. And we, we come, and the, the waitress comes, 
And before we can ever open our mouth, the first thing she says, it's not hello, it's not how you doing, Mike ain't make no batter. Excuse me? Mike ain't make no batter last night. And what she conveyed, my heart sunk. Because I had my mouth all ready for some Waffle House waffles. And she come to tell me, Mike can't make no batter. We drove 30 miles for a waffle. We were hungry for waffles. We were hungry for some atmosphere. We were hungry for fellowship. We were hungry for the community of the Waffle House. We were hungry for the connections that we, 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 we made at the Waffle House. We were, we were hungry for the fellowship. The Waffle House was a treat for us. And what made that all possible were the waffles that were made at the Waffle House. But what do you do when Mike ain't make no batter? Waffle House batter was, is supposed to, and I, and, and, and I, 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 I got a, I found, found the recipe online. Changed my life. Got me a waffle maker. That, I don't like them big, thick Belgian waffles. You've been to the Waffle House, that's not what they do. They do them thin, sweet, Jesus. I found me a thin waffle maker. And what I recognized when I made the batter and I put it immediately on, it didn't taste as good. I was excited because I had the batter. I had the ingredients. We're going to have us some Waffle House waffles. I ain't got to depend on Mike. Because Mike, Mike won't make no batter. And I put the waffles on, and they did. It was, it was a collective. It was a collective. Eh. What I failed to, in my excitement, I failed to read was they said you have to let the batter sit or set for six to eight hours. She was telling me Mike didn't make no batter last night to be ready for today. The Waffle House, that batter has to sit or set refrigerated for at least six to eight hours before you can serve it. And something happens in, in those sitting or setting hours that makes the serving moment special. Oh my God. Something happens between that time that Mike pours and, and makes the batter the night before and the moment you serve it that next day. And I need you to understand, I'm getting, getting ahead of myself, but it ain't Mike's fault. When it comes to spiritual things, Mike, Mike in, this, in this title, God, God is, 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 is taking the place of Mike. Because God won't do what Mike did in the natural. But if we don't turn the ovens on, to make the batter that has already been prepared. Those who come to the spiritual place where bread should be. Can't blame Mike. Got to blame the folks in charge of the oven. I'm getting somewhere. Don't get ahead of me. Ruth, Ruth chapter 1, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judea, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Eph Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, not Oprah, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. 
After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Here's the predicament. What's happening in this passage is that Naomi, her husband, and their two sons, they left Bethlehem and they moved to Moab. Now, Bethlehem is the place, uh, Bethlehem is, the, is, is uh, his, it's, it, geographically, it's five miles from Jerusalem. It's the place where God's people dwell. And Moab was a, was a pagan, a pagan worshiping country. It was, it was not a country included in the children of Israel. They left the place where God had prescribed to another place. And they went there. They went from the place whose purpose was to praise God and bring light to the rest of the world to a place that practiced pagan worship and idolatry. This is the predicament. And so the question is, why did they do that? They did it. The first one tells us there was a famine in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. They left, they left Bethlehem because there was nothing to eat in Bethlehem. And in the original Hebrew, Bethlehem means house of bread. So the reason they left the house of bread is because there was no bread in the house. In the culture of that day, bread was an essential part of their diet. And spiritual, spiritually speaking, bread represented the presence of God. So you have people who were used to having bread in the place that was designated as the house of bread suddenly to find there is no bread. So because of that, they left. Now, in the tabernacle, in the holy, in the holy place, was the table of the presence. Here's, here's, here's the importance of bread, the spiritual importance of it. In the, in, the, in, the, in the tabernacle, there was a table of the presence, and it sat in front of the curtain that led into the holy of holies. On this table, made of gold, sat 12 loaves of unleavened bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. This bread sat there. It was known as showbread. It was known. It is, it is also known as the bread of his presence. And it symbolized the continual presence of God with his people. It also pointed to the time when God would promise his presence within the church. It was showbread, and it was meant to show you that God is with you. And not only that, but God is your sustainer, and he is your supply. In the, holy, in the place, outside of the holies of holies, this table representing 12 tribes, 12 loaves of bread, it, bread was significant to the people of Israel. It was significant to, to their spiritual growth and well-being. We, we are living... <laughs> In a time where people have left the modern house of bread, the church, and are looking for the bread of life in other places. Let it marinate for a minute. Naomi and her family left the place where bread was supposed to be abundant because there was a famine. And they went looking in places where there was no promise of bread. Moab never promised you that bread was there. But, but Bethlehem, its name said, you can get bread here. But what do you do when the place where you're supposed to get bread is no longer serving bread? Today we're seeing that right now. Our churches are not, are not uh, uh, empty. Before, the, before, before COVID, before the, the, the restrictions, before all of that, there, there was a decline in Christian churches. 
Just this last week, I had a conversation with, a, with, a, with an individual, and, and we started talking about why young people aren't coming to church. It's not, they're not coming to church because they're not hungry. And here's the thing. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Before I get ahead of myself, you need to understand, regardless of who you are, what condition you're in, how much money you have or how much money you don't have, one thing you can't get around is hunger. If you are living on this earth, you can have more money in the bank, you can write a check and the bank bounce. Or you can be as poor, you can't rub two pennies together. What's, what, 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 what is a unifier and what is, what is an identifier that life is in you is hunger. Because if you get up today, you're going to be hungry before you go to bed. One thing you cannot, you cannot supplant, one thing you cannot ignore, one thing you cannot, you cannot uh, 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 acknowledge is the fact that we all get hungry. We all get hungry. Physically and spiritually. So you mean to tell me, Pastor, the unbeliever gets hungry? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So you mean to tell me that there's a spiritual hunger in the person who doesn't even believe God? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. The only difference between the believer who has a spiritual hunger and the unbeliever who has a spiritual hunger is that the believer knows, knows where bread should be. But what happens when the place where bread should be is no longer making bread? What happens when the place where bread should be, they've shut their ovens down and built stages for entertainment? What happens when the place where bread should be, they, they turn off the pilot light to their stoves and turn on stage lights to put on a performance? And our young people <laughs> are not coming to our churches because the, pl the place that, said, that, that advertised bread over here, when they came, they found everything else but bread. You listen to young people and they say, why well, go to church? Y'all doing the same thing I'm doing. And you can't be mad at them. Now I'm pastoring, in case y'all didn't know, I'm pastoring right now. We can't be mad at the world if they don't, don't want to come to church because we're, we need, because we're false advertising. Because we're saying, in a sense, might ain't make no batter. But the truth of the matter is, God did make the batter. We're just not firing up our, our ovens. The batter has already been made. It's already been prepared. The bread is ready to be baked. But it cannot be baked if our ovens are cold. And so Ruth and her family, they left, they left the place where bread should be. Because it was evident there was no bread. <laughs> and we cannot, we cannot get off your religious high horse and talking about what, 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 what the world is not doing and what the world uh, is doing and how wrong they are when your, when your oven is cold. Because you know what? A good smell attain, attain, uh, get anybody's attention. You ever been talking and walking and, and having a conversation and you smell something? It stopped the whole conversation. If we were cooking, if we were baking bread like we should be breaking bread, the same folks who's cussing and fussing, they, they should get a whiff. Here's my question. When they walk past you, what did they smell? Do we smell br fresh bread? Amen. Amen. We're living in that time where people have left the modern house of bread, the church, and they're looking for bread, the bread of life in other places. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. The bread of life. Jesus calls himself. He says, I am the bread of life. He lets you know in the, in the New Testament, I'm the bread. I am the bread. Jesus has said, I am the bread. And here's the thing. It, it is such a proprietary, it is such a proprietary uh, 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 ingredient, such a proprietary recipe. You can't get it nowhere else. 
but his house. So everybody who's trying to get the bread of life from other places are finding themselves still short because God is only, he's only licensed his recipe to the church. But if the church is not, does not have their ovens on, there is no bread. To put it bluntly, the world is sick of the church as it is today. I'm saying all this because once these restrictions are lifted, once people start coming back to the church, we need to be ready. We have to be ready. I'm talking, this is a message for the church today. You have to be ready because people are coming and they're, they're hungry. Their spirits and their souls are starving. Some have experienced a kind of loss that is unimaginable and their souls are starving and they're trying to, to satisfy that hunger for God with other things. When only the bread of heaven, the bread of life will, will sustain them. And we have got to have bread on hand when they come. Real quick, before you, before, you, before you miss it and anything else I got to say, well, I've been talking about firing up the ovens. What does that mean, Pastor? It means a relationship with God. That's what it means. When, when I say fire up the ovens, there, there are a whole lot of people right now who are, who are and I, it's, I hate to say it, leaders and pastors who are, who, are, who, are, who are ministering based off of their gift, their talent, and their, their, their ability. And it, it, and it tickles the ear, and it, it makes you forget your hunger for a moment, but you walk away still hungry. What, 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 will, what, will, what will transform and change a life is, is, that, is that your oven has been fired by the fire of the Holy Ghost, and you have developed the, 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 <clears throat> the ability to bake the bread of life and that bread of life comes because you've been connected to God. You have a relationship with God. That's, what's, that, that's the only thing that keeps your oven on. That's the only thing that lights your flame, the fire of God. Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. The Holy Ghost is what lights the fire of our ovens. And if we're not connected in relationship with God, I can show you a, a picture of bread, but it ain't real bread. I can talk about, and re, I can even read the recipe, but if there's no fire in my belly, if there's no relationship with God, then there's no real bread. And I was talking to this person, and I said, our young people, they're, they're, what they're really craving is an example of relationship. Show me how to love God today. That's what they're craving. They're not craving. Hear, hear me when I say it. Pa yes, the pastor's saying it. They're not craving more church. They say, show me how to live for God today. Show me how to live, how to live a life that brings him honor today. And you can't do that. You can't do that when your, when your oven is cold, when there's no fire. You can't do that if you, if, if you don't know who to turn to when you get in trouble. So the fire that I'm talking about, it's a relationship that comes from your connection with God and the Holy Spirit leading you. Church, the world is sick of the church as it is today. Those who have a genuine spiritual hunger for God, they fled to Moab. They fled to Moab. They've gone in search of bread to places where, where bread has n was never promised because the place where bread was promised has ceased baking bread. The world has always been hungry. They've always been hungry to hear, to hear from something beyond themselves. The world, listen, the world is, is there's always been a God-sized void in our souls that only can be filled by God. And the world tries to fill it with other things, but it never, it never settles, it never sets because only God can fill it. 
And so it's up to the church to fire her ovens up again. It's up to the church to make sure that the flames of the, of the fire of the Holy Ghost are burning on the inside. The world, the world has this hunger, and it drives them every, it drives them everywhere else but the church. And they try, they try substituting flesh recipes to try to feed the hunger that gnaws at their souls. Even though they're sick of the church, as it is today, they're still hungry for God, even if they don't know it. If you listen to somebody talking, especially somebody who's, who's, who's open enough to share with you where they're hurting, you can trace it back to relationship with God. Someone's hurting because they've been betrayed. They're hurting because they've been let down. I'm convinced it's because they were looking, they were looking for them to do and to be. They were looking for a person to do and to be what only God can do and be. We've got to keep our fires burning. We have, we have to stay hungry. We have to stay hungry. You ever been somewhere? Listen, Almeida ordered something. Um, these last three days, if you follow the, 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 the guidelines, we encourage you to introduce one regular meal back into your diet. And she ordered something. And I'm trying to stay holy. Not that she wasn't. Don't get it wrong. Not that she wasn't. I ain't trying to, I'm not trying to do that. I got to go home with you. I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to do that. Listen, pastor, I tried. No, I just felt, I said, I need to maintain my commitment. You understand what I'm saying, Frank? You understand? Okay. I'm trying, trying to maintain my, what I said I was going to do. Help me out, Terrence. <laughs> you say, you're your own, bro. <laughs> Ooh, geez. I love you, baby. I love you. I love you. Anyway, she ordered something. And I said, I'm going to maintain what I said I was going to do. I said, no, I'm okay. You sure? I'm okay. Okay. She ordered it. It comes in. And then I started looking at her stuff. I'm playing around with my stuff. I'm looking at her stuff. And I said to myself, dang, I should have got what you got. She's like, I asked you. That's something. Hunger begets hunger. Hunger, be you can be sitting there and not be hungry, but when somebody else comes in, then you start getting hungry. We, sh we should be that way to the world. As believers, we should be that way to the world. That when we're walking, the, the bread that we have baking in our oven should make those who weren't even thinking about it. Deserve. Hey, what is that you got? What? Can I have a piece of that? I went there, I mean, I just, you know, I started hanging around. I mean, you know how you congregate around. I started congregating around her, her plate, her table. I was waiting for her to ask me, did I want a piece? But she didn't ask me. And I knew I should have ordered my own. There ought to be a spiritual desire on, on the part of those who haven't tasted the heavenly gift because they see you enjoying the heavenly gift. It should make them, it should make them want what you got. It should make them want what you got. They're, they're hungry. There's still a, hung, a God hunger, in, even in the unbeliever. We know it because they're spending millions on self-help and and, and new age remedies, they're looking for it, but in all the wrong places because our ovens are cold. This and I'm done. Naomi and her family, they left the place 
they were at and went somewhere else because they could not find bread there. There's only one reason so many people are so willing to attempt to get in touch with something from the other side, even accepting the counterfeit in place of the real. Here's the reason. They don't know where to find the real thing. They don't know where to find the real thing. It's up to the, to the body of Christ to reintroduce the world to the real thing. To the real thing. The blame for this, and I, I hate saying this, I'm telling, I'm, if, if we don't become honest with ourselves, God can't deal with us. We have to reignite our ovens. It's not God's fault. It's not Mike's fault. He made batter over 2,000 years ago. He made the batter. But we have to have the ovens hot enough to bake it into bread. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We have to live that way so that when those who are hungry can know, I can get bread from this recipe. The recipe to satisfy the God hunger is not just being a good person. That's what people do. You just be a good person. There's a whole lot of good people going to bust hell wide open whole lot of people who, who can practice a certain level of restraint and still not know God. The recipe is he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might have a reestablished relationship with God. The recipe is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him would not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. The recipe is, though your sins be as scarlet, the blood of Jesus will wash them white as snow. Are we living that? As the church, we should be living that. We should be living that. Just on Wednesday when our last president was making his exit, the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, I need you to pray for his heart. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit because that, that would not have been my first idea. And I, say, I ask, I say, God, why now? He says, because I, I was using him these last four years. But now I need you to pray for his heart. Pray for his soul. And I begin to pray for that man. I begin to pray for his family. And I begin, as I begin to pray, joy began to come. I said, what would it, what would it look like? For this man to come forward and say, you know what? I've received Jesus for real. My oven was on. Because I desired God's salvation for somebody who by all accounts didn't deserve it. Come on, if we be honest, if we're just looking at the tape, if we're looking at the... But you know what? I didn't deserve it. And if you be honest, you didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. But still, somebody prayed for me. Had me on their mind. 
Their oven was on. The fire was burning. The bread was baking. And as they prayed, I could smell Kirabai Soto Koshaha. I could smell the fragrance. And I walked out of and stepped out of my old ways of life and living. Because as they were praying, the bread was baking. As they were praying, the aroma of the, the bread, the ingredients, the recipe, it was working together. All things are working together for good. And I was beginning to fall in love with the fragrance. As some of you did as well. There's some people in this world who by all accounts, if we look at if we look at the record, they don't deserve it, but you know what that feels like. Talking to believers, you know what that feels like. And they need to smell the aroma of fresh baking bread. They need to smell the aroma. This is what forgiveness smells like. This is what grace smells like. This is what love smells like. It ain't Mike's fault that the bread ain't baking. Bad has been made. Talking to believers right now. Will you turn on your oven? Will you get into a place where the Spirit of God can begin to warm your heart, warm your, your spirit, to think beyond yourself and to consider that unsaved person? To begin to live a life that reflects the, the presence and the power of God so that our young people can see what it looks like to live saved in an unsaved world. So that our young people can, can look at us and not see hypocritical activity, but see a holy lifestyle. Is your, is your oven hot enough, thank you, Holy Ghost, to admit when you're wrong, and seek God's forgiveness. That's what our young people need to see. That's what they need to hear. That's what they're hungering and thirsting. They need to know that you can fall and get up again. They need to know that even though you're not where you need to be, God still says, I want you, I love you. They need to, they don't even need, they not only need to know it, they need to see it. It ain't Mike's fault. It ain't Mike's fault that you're not, you're not showing the love of God like we should. Because he's put it in us. Have your lamps trimmed and burning. That's what I hear. Have your lamps trimmed and burning. What that scripture talks about is being ready. Being ready to receive the bridegroom. Being ready when Christ returns. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be, when he does return, I want to be able to say, because I kept my oven on, these are the ones that were attracted to the smell that we're attracted to the scent of fresh baking bread. God's calling for the church. Turn your lights back on. I get excited. I get excited when, I, when I'm able to drive past Krispy Kreme and I see the light on. Anybody who knows about Krispy Kreme, when the light is on, you can get fresh donuts. Some of the ones that just melt in your mouth. 
The Lord is in that flame fresh tunnel. He's in it. I, I promise. He's in it. And the joy to get a to get donuts when the hot light is on. My prayer is for the body of Christ. Is that when our light is on, souls are being saved. When our light is on, lives are being changed. When our light is on, people are being transformed by the power of God. It ain't Mike's fault. When that lady told us, when that waitress told us Mike ain't make no better, I was mad at Mike. And I ain't want nothing else on the menu. Yeah, they didn't have no bread. We're going to 7 Eleven and get some more bread. I don't, want, I don't want nothing else you got. There are people coming to church. They're going to be coming to church. And as wonderful as your choir sing, they didn't come for the choir. As awesome as your, as your, your, your outreach ministry is, your love ministry, they didn't come for that. Pastor, as wonderful as you preach, they ain't come for your preaching. They came for God. They came for the love of God. They came for the promise of bread that will change their life. Let's make sure they, they find it when they get here. Let's make sure they find it when we get here. Father God, we thank you and we give you glory in the name of Jesus. For bread in the house of bread. We thank you now, God, for ovens reigniting and the flame of the Holy Ghost baking the bread creating a sense and an aroma that causes those who are hungry to now know where to find what they've been looking for where to find what their soul has been craving we thank you God we love you, Father. In Jesus' name. Keep us hungry. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Stay hungry. We'll see you on the next one. Good morning, church. I've been given the opportunity to present to you today the too good to be true news of Jesus Christ. You know, the misconception about going to heaven is that a lot of people think that if I'm just a good person, then I get to go to heaven. But that's not true at all. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. And the only person who can counteract that wage is the blood of Jesus Christ. So if this is you, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you this opportunity to receive him right here, right now. If this is you, repeat after me. Say, Father, I confess I'm a sinner and my sins deserve death. But I believe Jesus, the Son of God, died for my sins. He rose three days later. I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart. Thank you, God, for saving me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we believe you've been born again. If this is you, reach out to us, comment below. We want to talk with you and help you in these first initial steps of a brand new life in Christ. God bless you.